One of the most bizarre designs must have been engineer Lebdenko's idea for breaking through on the Austrian front in 1915 with his giant wheeled tricycle, which the Soviets later named the Tsar's tank. It's basically a giant trike. It's some 30-odd metres high. It's approximately 30 metres long. Two giant wheels, spoked wheels at the front and solid wheels at the rear of the vehicle. Mounted halfway up, about 15 metres off the ground, is the gun platform and driving platform. And in this you've got uh, four naval six-pounders, plus machine guns, plus the, the captain of the vehicle, because it was treated as a ship, a ship of the land rather than the ship of the sea. On this bridge structure between the two big wheels, some 20 men in various fighting compartments and ammunition compartments. The engine is back down uh, on the rear, driving directly onto the rear axle of the vehicle. Its top speed is approximately three and a half miles an hour, and it's using about eight gallons of fuel per mile. So it's not exactly a cheap and easy vehicle. Steering is almost impossible because it's done by breaking the wheels on each side. It's just a great monstrous monstrosity. If you've got a vehicle standing sort of nearly 30 meters above you, over 100 feet higher than you are, trundling towards your trench, firing away with six pound guns, it's going to frighten the life out of you. Or at least that's what the Tsar hoped, but of course it turned out to be a complete and utter fiasco. Very much a, a Leonardo type de invention. It should never have been allowed on a battlefield. The first tank built in Russia was a reverse-engineered version of the Renault FT-17. At the end of the Great War, the FT-17 was seen as being one of the more uh, revolutionary is probably the wrong word to use, but uh, one of the more modern tanks in service, and it had by that stage adopted the classical configuration of two tracks, an armoured body and an armoured turret containing the armament. Uh, when you think of the British Mark IV and Mark V tanks, which were basically lozenge-shaped vehicles and which had sponsons on each side with guns in, they were quite archaic. It was realised quite early on that a, a tank with a rotating turret containing the gun was far more effective. <laughs> Сталин сказал, больше оружия, больше танков. Московские патриоты рапортуют, на Энском заводе уже налажен ремонт боевых машин. This tank is T-34, T-34 in Russia, or T-34 in uh, English. It's, I think, the best tank uh, of uh, World War II. And uh, thanks to such tanks, uh, I think uh, we became winner in World War II. The Battle of Kursk was the focal point of the German Operation Zitadal, which proved to be their last great offensive in the East in the summer of 1943. It was important to the Germans to regain the initiative in the East after the crushing defeat of Stalingrad. Indeed, Hitler stated that its success would shine forth like a beacon, a signal to all those that doubted a German victory in the war. It's a T-34. It's hot and hard work. And the bad side, it's a T-34. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's a splendid machine. Absolutely excellent, but uh, just Robust. steering's a bit on the heavy side today. Bit of dust? Bit of dust. A little bit of dust. You got, you got the dust there, Clive? Thirty-four, the ultimate big boy's toy.
The 254 did have a hall-mounted uh, machine gun, 790 machine gun, uh, that was still carried on onto the T55s. But after the first few hundred were produced, they decided to uh, to to stop the idea. Is the driver's got enough to do in the tank anyway? Because all the controls in T55 are all manual. There's no power assistance, hydraulics, nothing. It's physical strength. Someone who's isn't strong, couldn't drive one. The clutch is an absolute nightmare. Uh, you know, it's almost two feet to push it down. Um, you can't ride the clutch at all. You must take your foot straight off the clutch, otherwise you'll burn the engine clutches out, uh, the metal on metal clutches. There's lots of things about the tank that is reliable um, if you know how to use it, but if you don't know how to use it, you, you will break it. Um, but if you use it properly, they're good tanks. Another Russian tank descended almost directly from the T-34 series via several other intermediate tanks. The immediate successor to the T-54 uh, carries a 100mm cannon uh, as used in the Su-100, uh, the D-10, which was originally a piece of naval artillery. V12 39 litre diesel. Not supercharged, naturally aspirated. Um, fuel consumption, well, we don't worry about that. <laughs> it's not us paying for the diesel. T72 is quite an aggressive tank to drive. It's a, uh, I, I class it as being a boy racer of the tank because it does move quite quickly. Um, being that it um, has quite a fast engine in it, it does manoeuvre quite happily over wide spaces. When you get into tight spaces, it can be quite a bit of a, um, a difficulty in moving and manoeuvring it about. The Leningrad Kirov uh, tractor factory has been producing or developing gas turbines since 1948, uh, mainly for the Russian aviation industry, and eventually they produced gas turbines to power the Hein, the HIP, and many other helicopters. And they take one of these engines and they drop it into the back of a T-64. And they decide this is the way to go. They gain upgun it using the heavy tank factory's new turret uh, with the auto loader and the new 125mm gun. They change the transmission, they change the running gear, they change the track, and they end up with what becomes the T80. So now the Russians have, for the first time in their history, three main battle tanks all coming in out on the production line, um, all vying for the position of the Soviet tank and the Soviet Politburo don't know what to do because all three factories have got to be kept in production because you know they've got thousands of workers tied up in these vehicles and the Russians cannot afford unemployment. So they agree to go with the T-64 which is now upgunned uh, to match the T-80 and the T-72. They also decide to go with the T-80 and keep the turbine and everything like that. They also decide that the T-72 will become part of the Russian army. It will be the second line. So in the front line, you're going to have the T-64 alongside the T-80. And then behind these, you're going to have the T-72. The Soviets, having got three main battle tanks on the battle area, they now need to standardize. This is all against the ethos of the Russian army. They usually have a set piece of equipment, like the AK-47, which dominates the uh, Russian army, the MiG, which dominates the Russian air force. And in the tank world, they need to do this. They've got to get rid of the T-64, the T-80, and the T-72. They've got to standardize. And in 2002, what the Soviets say is, we are going to develop a new tank. And along comes the T-90, 
and all they've really done is taken the best parts from the T64, the T80 and the T72, pull them all together in one lump and they've produced the T90. And the T90 is now slowly coming into Soviet service as their main battle tank. It will replace all the others eventually. But because of the economic constraints placed upon the Soviet army, they're only buying about 180 tanks a year. Now, considering the Soviet army's got over 4,000, this is going to take them a long time to start get standardization within the Soviet army, which will cut down on the number of spare parts, it'll cut down on all the different training, and many other things and will give the Soviet army exactly what it wants. Standardization, simplicity. We've gone round this many, many times. The tank arrives on the battlefield, then by the end of World War II, everybody's saying, the guided missiles, king of the battlefield. The tank is dead, long missile. By 1960, everybody's saying, oh, hang on, no, it's not missiles aren't that great and once we fire them what do we do so then the tank comes back again and now you've got great machines uh, like the M1 Abrams like the Challenger um, like the new Russian T90 and the Leclerc and so on and these tanks are going to dominate the battlefield they with the new type of protection measures like explosive armor like uh, the new arena system and infrared sensors built into the turrets for automatic smoke discharging, which both NATO and the Soviets are all developing. The tank is now survivable on the modern battlefield. It will dominate because you have to have a big machine to break through a defensive structure. Yes, the Air Force can do it to a certain extent, but you still need a man on the ground in a big ugly machine to take that first breakthrough. Then the man up with his boots, will come along in his Bradley or his Warrior or his BMP3 and he will deploy behind the tanks and he will take and hold the ground. But he needs that big machine up front because if he runs into a guy who happens to have a 20 millimeter cannon on a Toyota pickup, he is very, very vulnerable. But you put a ba main battle tank in front of him, he is now survivable. So it's a very much an integrated battlefield. That is how it's going to go where the man, the soldier on the ground is going to be able to look at a, an object uh, like a Scud missile launcher, like an artillery battery. He will then be able to talk the pilots in from his position. The pilots will then see live video from his helmet cam of the position. They will then bomb it. Then will, in will come the tanks and the armored personnel carriers and the position will be taken. That is how the modern battlefield is going to go. It's going to go electronic.